Welcome back to the Patient No Longer podcast. We have with us a recognizable face and a returning guest yeah. to the Patient No Longer podcast. I've got with me Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike, hello. I'm excited to be here for round two. This is round two. Okay, let's see if you can go the distance. And for those who don't know, and of course, I think a lot do, um, Dr. Mike is a board certified family medicine physician, still practicing. Mm -hmm. You're also a social media influencer. You've got an audience of over 25 million followers across platforms, not just the Patient No Longer podcast. You also have a YouTube channel that is quite popular where you debunk medical misinformation and you educate their audience about their health and body. So I'm so happy to have you here. And one thing that you taught me and have really expressed throughout oh. your channels and your influence is that you can answer a question about anything. <laughs> so That's the beauty of family medicine. You have to be prepared for anything. Because right. even what it says on the chart or on the visit notes is almost always not the reason people come in. Exactly. So I love that about you. And I think you'll, you'll share some really on the ground stories about that. But I'm actually going to ask you a question that everybody asks about because I want to hear how your answer is different. Okay. And it's the topic that comes up every hour of every day if you're in healthcare. Fair. And that's AI. Mm. Artificial intelligence. We're talking about it at NRC Health. And I'm super curious for you. What is its impact specifically on physicians? Right now, not much. Yeah. You know, it's not involved in our day to day as much as I thought it would be at this point. You would think with the exponential growth of technology, we would have AI more streamlined in taking care of patients, in documentation, in billing, and it's nowhere to be found. At best, I'll have a search feature where I can search the patient's chart and type in a colonoscopy and get a colonoscopy report pulled up. But besides that, I feel like AI is the next frontier of healthcare because we desperately need help with a lot of the mundane tasks so we can focus on the patient sitting in front of us and that human, human first connection. So it's sort of like AI is missing in action. Like we're yeah. talking about it a lot, but when we yeah. go back to our day to day, where is it? Yeah, you know, like I just had a, a gentleman on my podcast also, Dr. Mike, PhD. Okay. And he was talking about how AI is such an exponential growth factor in our lives. And while I think that is possible, I don't feel like that's playing out in a practical sense. Mm. There's a lot of these rate limiting steps. This is like my chemistry brain coming out. Sure. A rate limiting step is a part of a, a formula or an equation that every other part of the equation has to wait to complete. So it's what slows down the equation, something happening. And in this case, AI is that rate limiting step and we just don't have a good reason why AI is not more ubiquitous within our healthcare system. For the record, as an analogy, when we try to get out of the door for school in the morning, my three-year-old is our rate limited staff. <laughs> That's a good so, analogy. So um, I can picture that perfectly. I want to ask you a lot about digital, and I want to ask you about something that we actually talked about a lot last year on this podcast, and that was misinformation and disinformation. Yep. And just in case they didn't listen to the episode before, okay. I'd like you to sort of give your definition of each, and then I want to know... Where are we at? Because you really painted a picture of a fight that we're in, and there's sort of a war that we're fighting right now, and, and I wanna know how we're progressing in those battles. I think we're in this world of alternative facts, and even saying the term makes me a little bit queasy because I'm not <laughs> sure what it means, and that's where both terms need to be very carefully defined, and I know different institutions and different providers have different sort of ways of approaching mis and disinformation. For me, disinformation comes with intent. It's putting out misinformation that you know is gonna cause harm and you have a reason for it. You're trying to gain something and that's disinformation. Misinformation is putting out incorrect knowledge, whether by accident, uh, because you read something and you're just spreading another person's message off social media, maybe you're excited about some preliminary work and you put too much emphasis on it, or in a more insidious way, some of these medical dramas on television spread misinformation. You watch any Grey's Anatomy, Good Doctor episode, someone's heart stops, no one's doing chest compressions. No one's teaching how to do CPR. What a great opportunity. No, they run to get the defibrillator because it looks good on television. But when someone's heart flatlines, we do not use a defibrillator. <laughs> we do chest compressions, you chest don't? compressions, chest compressions. <laughs> and that's actually a form of misinformation because it actually creates a level of distrust when people do go to the hospital, not surrounding chest compressions, but let's say the notion of you watch these shows, you think you know what happens in a hospital, and then you realize you don't actually spend 24-7 with the doctor. 
Right. There's other professionals that are taking care of you. There's nurses, there's techs, there's CMAs, uh, pharmacy um, techs, students, residents, so many people involved in the process. But all of that is new to you because every other experience you've seen on television mm -hmm. has been radically different. So we need to be very careful of how we talk, present, and ultimately study healthcare so that we're not purveyors of this misinformation. It's so interesting how you paint the picture, and especially in the patient experience, because we get these inpatient comments across the country where they will, say, they will equate the value of it sometimes to the minutes the doctor was here. Yep. My bill was $600. I won't use your name because you'd never do sure. this, but doctor so-and-so was only here for one minute yep. for 600 bucks. Is that frustrating to you as a physician when you hear that? Is it understandable from the patient perspective? How do you deal with it? I that? think it's very understandable because patients expect human care. They don't want a robot to care for them. And as a result, what our healthcare system is creating is a system where no one wins. The patient is left upset because they didn't get enough time with their physician. The physician is upset because they have to see a quota of patients and they have to be out the door, otherwise they're not getting reimbursed for care. Or maybe they're getting even uh, disciplinary notices from their institution. Sure. So no side is winning here. It's not like we have suddenly more doctors gaslighting patients. It's actually the reality is the system is set up in a way where it seems like everyone's gaslighting everyone. Yeah. And that's where I think we need to bring it back to the human connection and focus on things like primary care, which I'm very passionate about. But even that's not easy to talk about on social media these days. Why is it not easy to talk about? I'm curious. I know well, you want to. Well, I, I want to and I'm passionate about it. But Again, the healthcare system is set up in such a way where people are so frustrated with the notion of primary care not being available, being yes. too expensive, doctors not having openings, people having to wait four months for an appointment, um, doctors not accepting new patients. So they go and they get the next best thing, which is urgent care. Mm. And they just get the temporary fix for their problem. And long term, that's not a great solution. But when I put, go on social media and I explain the value of primary care and how important it is, it almost comes off like I'm gaslighting those patients because right. they want primary care, they can't get it, and here I am telling them what they need. Yes. Very difficult situation all around. It is, and it's interesting since you mentioned urgent, urgent care. So NRC Health has done some studies of this and this idea that there's an increasing openness to retail care and urgent care. It's about six out of 10 consumers nationally that say, I'm open to it. Doesn't mean they want it. A lot of times <laughs> yeah. they say, I will go to urgent care, but if I could have a physician in front of me, I would prefer that. Exactly, and the reality is that's not what also gives the best outcomes. Right. We have to think about good outcomes, practicality, and then patients' needs and wants, and figuring out how we can put all those in a pie chart where they cross uh, across one another. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to posit something that I think your career has, has really influenced and reinforced, and that is when we aren't in front of a physician all the time like we want to be, yep. even in the patient experience where there's times where we are alone, we fill in the gaps. And I think sometimes that's where misinformation and disinformation can be powerful. Yep. We have a guest on this season on Patient No Longer, Dr. G, who you know, who yep. talks a lot about the effects of that on the patient. But then we've got you. We've got Dr. Mike who's coming in. If I don't have a doctor in front of me, I have YouTube on my phone. And I know that that's part of your passion and your mission to fill in some of those gaps for people that aren't your patients. How can other hospitals, health systems, doctors across the country how can they help influence and fill in those gaps? Because, well, you are almost everywhere, but maybe can't be everywhere. No, I, we definitely need more reinforcements. That's true. I think there's two true values that come from providers being online and readily available to provide general education. One, it provides direct counterattack to the misinformation because when misinformation started spreading at the beginning of the pandemic, there wasn't enough physicians online to fact check it all. Right. In fact, there were almost none. I, I felt like I was one of the sole voices on YouTube trying to debunk every time some new article came out making a claim that was untrue. The second part is that when you provide patients general information on a condition, if you provide them an accurate view of what a visit with a doctor is like, that will make their experience in the office better because it will allow them to get information before the visit, come in a little bit more educated, a little more empowered, asking better questions, and I know there's nothing better than an engaged patient. So if a patient has come in and has done pre-research on what they think is going on, I know that visit's gonna go well, even if we have limited time. 
So there's two great benefits for it. And hospitals need to invest in this. A lot of thought uh, when it comes to social media with big businesses like hospitals and nonprofits is let's get a young person and we'll throw them on the social media handle and this is going to go great. It will not go great. <laughs> That is asking for trouble, not just because they're likely to make a mistake and this is a serious field. you got to treat all your posts and content with the knowledge that patients are looking at this, those are who, who are going through a difficult time. But then also, this requires strategy, studying platforms, understanding marketing, understanding human connection. That's what social media is. It's like life on another level, meaning like life with fuel thrown on it, life on steroids. And until we buy into that notion and realize we have to be where patients are, it's going to be a, a long hill to climb up. So I love your, I love your thought there on the young, I, I've got a CEO who I won't name who said, <laughs> you know, the only thing in my organization I would trust a 22 year old to run is social oh, media. That's the biggest mistake ever. And people were like <laughs> nodding their heads in the audience. And I was sitting back there saying, are you sure? <laughs> I don't think maybe a 22 year old should run anything. No offense to Gen Z. Yeah. But it, it really is a challenge, and it kind of gets me to a bigger area of, of healthcare and, and healthcare strategy, and that's around what do we market? So, so we've got a fresh piece of data that indicates over half of people have said, I haven't heard any new messages from my local hospital health system doctor. I heard a lot during COVID. Everybody teamed up. It was a unified response needed to be. Yep. But I haven't heard fresh messages now. I'm kind of wondering, like, what is the value of my local hospital? What do they do well, and why should I become their patient? Where do you come out? Because doctors always have a fascinating opinion on marketing, but like what's marketing's role right now? Well, I think marketing needs to be thought less in a transactional sense, but instead more of a partnership. You're trying to get people to buy in into your organization on a bigger level. You're trying to be there holistically for them. So when they're searching for information at home, you want them to be able to use you as a resource. Like how often am I in an office trying to look up a condition and print out a patient handout and sometimes it's not readily available. That's tough for a doctor because we don't unfortunately have the time to sit and for 20 minutes go through every side effect, every potential situation that can arise with, it, with their new diagnosis. And maybe the patient doesn't have the ability to come back for a follow up. So you do the second best thing. You recommend it from another institution, but what a loss. You could have had that patient holistically part of your institution, buying in, continuing to become part of the, the team, and instead we're pushing them away and having them seek care elsewhere. Yeah, and there's such a, that, that's such a painful thing to hear. And, and frankly, you alluded to this, really the access crisis that's happening right now, where we've got patients on the other end saying, I'm being told to wait six months, 10 months. I'm being told I can't be scheduled because the schedule doesn't go out longer than yep. a year. Yep. That's maybe the worst one. And so they're trying to find alternatives. Many of them, though, are, are willing to wait, but they want to be educated. And we've got, we've got executives who I will tell you again, they're saying, oh, we're full? Well, this is great. And I think that's such a head in the sand thing. So if any of them are listening, not that we'd call them out, what would you tell them about, yeah, you're full right now, but? Healthcare as a business model is very messy. Yeah. It's hard to think about healthcare like an Uber model. You don't want to have patients feel like they need to only use your services when something's going wrong. You want to be present for them in preventive means. You want to have them come in for wellness visits. You want to have conversations with them when they're doing well, because only then will you have buy-in long-term and therefore actually get good outcomes. And that's why there's, this been, uh, there's been this movement towards getting patient values improved, getting better patient scores as a way to motivate and create incentives for hospitals instead of making sure all the slots are filled, but making sure the slots are filled in a productive way where you're actually helping people. Well, because when those, uh, you know, those, uh, all of our capacity is full, what is the capacity and what's the quality of it? And, and we know through scores, we know through HCAPs, it really hasn't moved that much. No. Public reporting's crossed 15 years now, and it, it mostly looks like a flat line coming across. I'm curious because people are getting reimbursed on that. There's executives who are saying, I'm trying to tell my, my other people, influential people in my organization that it's not just about patient scores. Do you have any advice for them if they say, if they're not listening to me about caps, what will they listen to me on? I just had, this is happening when I talked about this earlier, 
where doctors feel like patients are upset at them and patients feel like doctors are gaslighting them and it's really the healthcare system that's at fault. This is an example of that because not only are patients harmed when they don't have access, there's barriers to them seeking care, they have to wait these huge wait times, yeah. but doctors are also burning out. And it's not necessarily because they have to see so many patients and doctors are like this group of people that don't want to work. They went through medical school, they went through residency, they know what it's like to work. Yeah. We know what it's like to work. But the reality is we want to work and actually help people, not fill up slots. Yes. And until we start seeing how this is ultimately going to be a situation that's going to burst at the seams at some point, we have to f do this before the problem explodes. Right. Yeah. right, you're exactly right. And and I think that's music to the ears of physician, but I think it's becoming more clear outside of that. I think sometimes we misunderstand the role of physicians. The line you mentioned last time on the last podcast that stuck with me this whole year was that physicians need to be able to use their human side, be able to show their human side of care, which is something we also need to encourage. And how do you show your human side in five minutes? That's so true. That <laughs> like, is so true. Yeah. I'm curious, and I'm asking this question of all the doctors. And this season, we have four physicians okay. on our podcast. So you're one of four, and I'm going to ask this question to all four docs. The future of the American doctor. Because I hear it's going to be all right. I hear it's going to be dystopia. I hear all kinds of things. It's going to be AI. I'm curious, from your point of view as a physician with the influence you have, what do you see as the future of the physician? Predictions always suck because they're heavily biased by people's moods and what's going on in their own lives. And it's hard to think big picture. Like even trying to imagine what 320 million people look like, what that number is like, yeah. is, is pretty not doable for the human mind. Right. Um, secondly, I like to think of myself as an optimist, but optimists are not always the most accurate. In fact, pessimists tend to be more accurate than optimists, but they tend to be less healthy. So uh, to try and be my healthiest self, I'm very optimistic that we can come together and it's gonna take collaboration and there will be missteps. But what I think is beautiful about the healthcare field, if we truly get back to its scientific roots, is that it's an ever evolving field that's not afraid to question itself. Mm. And when we're doing research, we're actually not testing to prove our hypothesis, we're looking for the null hypothesis. We're looking to disprove what we're seeking to find out. Right. So hopefully with this notion of the scientific method of constantly trying to improve, create better outcomes, we will ultimately see that this is not sustainable. We can't keep doing what we're doing and hoping this will work. It might buy us some time to create a better solution, but that solution has to come. Right. The final boss is still waiting for us. Yeah. And I think you are an optimist because I've seen your content. Uh, I love the optimism that shows through. You've been able to maintain that for many years through residency, <laughs> yeah. through actual practice, through now. You seem as happy and optimistic as when I saw you a year ago. And it's been a long year, Dr. Mike. It's been a long year. Yeah. How do you maintain that? I had someone ask me recently, a client of NRC Health said, we have a lot of cynicism in our organization. We just sort of mumble healthcare heroes to zeros and some of those other things that the research doesn't always reflect, by the way. Right. But the cynicism is real. When you sense that, do you have ways in which you try to break that up or, or turn that into optimism? I would be wary using those private conversations as reflections as to how people really feel. Yeah. Cynicism can be a coping mechanism of dark humor. So sometimes we like to say things like that behind the scenes as healthcare heroes to zeros or whatever it yeah. is. Yeah. And we say that in order to cope through difficult times and we use humor to make that happen, and sometimes it's dark humor. Um, on my podcast, I was just speaking with a very popular nurse creator uh, on social media, and he was saying how nurses have the best sense of humor, because it's always the darkest, <laughs> yes. uh, most interesting <laughs> sense of humor, and I agree with that. So I, I don't know that it's necessarily true that a lot of doctors are cynical about their situation, but I know that they're desperately anxious. In fact, one hour before you and I are having this conversation, I got a message by a prominent uh, physician that's in media, but also uh, working as a provider, saying that they're burned out. 
Like yeah. what's happening across the, the globe? Is this happening to all our colleagues? And we had an intimate conversation discussing why is this happening? What can we do for ourselves? Should we uh, fight back against our institutions? Should we have meetings? Should we uh, make messages on social media? And there's no one size fits all answer sure. here. You have to do everything. You have to talk to your political leaders. You have to get on social media. You have to meet with your local um, representatives in the hospital systems. All of that needs to be done. And you're really doing all of those things. So I had someone, I was, I was taking some questions from some colleagues before this. I was saying we got round two coming up. And I love this question, so I'm gonna hit you with this one. How do you balance all of the things that you do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a disaster, if we're being honest. It's, okay. it's always a mess. Uh, I'm always trying to bounce from one activity to another. Luckily, I have high energy levels, and that works well for me. But it's not sustainable either. I mean, what I'm trying to do uh, I, I, the reason I push so hard is because within the last 10 years, I keep finding myself in a position where I know it's not going to last. So I'm like, I have to give my all to make sure that I squeeze all the juice out of this orange. And we keep doing it. We keep squeezing <laughs> that orange. But it, uh, look, people get tired. People burn out. They need vacations. And I say that as someone who never takes vacations. So I need to take my own advice on this. Okay, well, in that spirit, I'm going to give you a little break because I'm going to hit you with a new speed round. Oh, so this okay. is low. This is, you know, don't don't put too much weight on this and okay. don't overthink it. Okay. Immediate gut reactions here gut is what reactions. we're looking for. Okay, okay? Hold on a second. sip of water. I'm asking this of all the physicians, and I swear it's not a competition. Because okay, it's you guys definitely are kind a competition. Of competitive as doctors. Yeah. <clears throat> so these are quick dogs, dogs or cats? Dogs, easy. The beach or the mountains? Mountains. Favorite TV show of all time? All you. It has to be Friends. Okay. It has to be Friends. When I came to America, it, it was Friends. That one gives people the most trouble. Uh, call or text? Good old fashioned text. Phone. Text. Even though I want it to be called, but it's text. Okay, San Diego or LA? New York. <laughs> you answered New York. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I just See can't. Other? I can't. I can't. Yeah. Are you writing that in? Did you write in yeah, New York? Yeah, that's my. Uh, my vote on that one. Okay, I love that one. Um, I want to go to a question that someone in particular gave me, uh, not a colleague, but someone who said, I would love to know his advice on this. Okay. Stress management. You've already alluded to your own stress. Yeah. I feel it too, my own stress. What advice would you give someone who's really trying to balance health and stress? I think you have to sit down and really put pen to paper and write out your priorities, what's important, and not be afraid to sacrifice things that at some points in your life were important that you no longer have time for. And that's hard because sometimes that means you're not gonna be watching your favorite sport. Sometimes that means you have to say bye-bye to a partner. And you know, that's, that's the reality. If you, if you wanna have a healthy lifestyle, sometimes you just have to cut certain activities out. That's fair. It's tough, but it's fair. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to escalate the challenge a little bit because this is, a, this is a big, gnarly topic. It's something that's being talked about a lot in healthcare. That's workplace violence. We just recently had an all-afternoon summit um, talking to providers, talking to other executives about workplace violence, and you get different opinions about it. Is, it. is it truly an epidemic? Is it something we can manage at the individual organizational level? I think there's a lot of different opinions on workplace violence. And I'm really curious about yours. I don't think it's an epidemic. I think it's endemic. I think it's just always been happening. Yeah. And the sad reality is that it's very underreported. And because it's so endemic, no one talks about it. Right. So if you think about the common cold, right, that's an endemic virus that's always around us. But no one's going around writing articles about the common cold anymore. No one's seeking cures, really. And... That's a shame for violence in our ERs, in our primary care offices, for nurses. Like I, I was on the bus the other day and I saw that there's a sign that says it's a higher uh, penalty to assault a bus driver. And I'm like, why don't we have that for healthcare workers? Why are they not protected? And I actually did some Googling on this and looked at uh, some counterpoints, because I like looking at counterpoints to see uh, what other people think about this. Right. And they mentioned how that could unfortunately target those who have intellectual disabilities or maybe psychiatric conditions. And I think that perhaps we can use our judgment in those situations to make sure that we're not unfairly targeting an individual with a condition like that. 
and instead not use that as a reason to allow people to get hurt continuously. This has been ongoing for years. Right. Yeah, and we are fed up. I love that answer. And um, I think that it's something that we have to continue to monitor. Uh, we were talking beforehand. This wasn't live. And so I wanted to ask you, you have a particular opinion about gurus. <laughs> so before I ask you the very last question, talk to me about gurus. Yeah, I, this day and age on social media, doctors that are popular tend to get into the situation where they think they have all the answers. And you pointed out as we started this conversation that you like that I, I, I can answer a lot of your questions. Yes. But if we're being honest, I'm not really answering your questions. I'm explaining what I do know. I'm explaining the limits of my knowledge. I'm giving nuance there. I don't have all the answers. Right. And I'm not afraid to say I don't know, especially to a patient, so that we can research it together, get down to the best answer for them. And these days on social media, it, that doesn't work well. It's, yeah. it's hard to gain traction in the algorithm. So now you have this rise of these health gurus who claim to have all the answers. If you listen to this song, you will lower your anxiety levels by 65%. <laughs> Step into my office, see my patients that are having trouble showering in the morning, right. going to work, having terrible thoughts inside their head, and tell them to listen to a song, and that'll work 65% of the time. It's ridiculous. Yes. And that's the goal of my YouTube channel, not just to debunk disinformation, but to put context and nuance back into the conversation. It's been missing for so long because it's hard to make that organically grow within the algorithms, but it's possible. I think my channel is the prime result of it. Last month, we had 150 million views yeah, talking about nuance. So it's possible. You just have to try <laughs> and figure out a way to make it happen. You do, and your honesty is why I want to ask you questions. So, but I'm gonna, I, I, and I love the channel too. By the way, I get a lot out of the channel. I watched the recent one on Sunblock. Okay. As an Irish American and heavy user of Sunblock, I use those tips. Okay, so good. I appreciate that. I'm one of those millions. I'm gonna ask you one more question. I'm gonna change it a little bit from last time as a repeat guest. Fair. Um, this was the day one question, and I want to ask it specifically of those out viewing and listening who want to have some of the influence that you have, even if it's not millions, mm -hmm. even if it's 10,000, 10. I mean, 10,000 is still a miracle. Yes. What doctor to break through. 30 years ago was influencing 10,000 people? Exactly. So like, that's amazing. And we need to celebrate that and not look at it like, oh, you're a micro-influencer. No, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I've been called a micro-influencer. Um, <laughs> but anybody out there who, let's say they want to influence more than themselves right. and, and they want to fight for health in the way that you do. so you get into an elevator with them mm -hmm. on their day one of saying, I want to be like Dr. Mike. I want to influence people. What's a piece of advice you give them on that elevator ride? Well, stop trying to be Dr. Mike and be better than Dr. Mike. Uh, be yourself. Learn what skills you have that make you special, that make you stand out, and pair that with things you enjoy. And from there, you have the beginnings of a formula for how you can start creating content surrounding education, surrounding medicine, uh, reaching out to patients, because ultimately, you don't know how the world will perceive you until you start pu putting content out. Right. You also don't know what type of content you'll enjoy making. Uh, you know, when I first started, I thought I would never do podcasting. It's too long. It's going to be hard to hold people's attention. And then what do you know? Now we have a podcast channel that's very successful, and I've fallen in love with doing it. But that was only made possible because of the fact that we're not afraid to experiment, try different avenues, and find out what works best for you. I think if those people are even just as good as you, not even better, I think healthcare will be a better place. I hope so. I appreciate, as always, your transparency, your honesty, and then the information that you share. It's always a pleasure, Dr. Mike. Thanks Thank for being so on the much. Patient No Longer podcast. Excited to do it. Looking forward to round three. Round three. Yeah, OK, round three. you said it. Yeah. Okay. In my professional boxing match, I went four <laughs> rounds, which were all the rounds. I so saw that, too. We have four rounds. Yeah, no, no punches thrown today, but it felt great. And we will absolutely have you back for round Thank three. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks again. <laughs>